century BC is a very significant period in the history of India. This was the period in which we find political, social, economic and religious changes were taking place which was of great consequence in the later history of India. The first change that comes to our notice was the formation, the political formations. The small political units were becoming gradually integrated into what was known as the Mahajanapadas and we find there were such 16 Mahajanapadas in northern India at that time. We need not think that this formation of the Mahajanapadas were always a very peaceful process. True that some were integrated into larger units because of the internal erosion of the tribes but we find that in many places it needed, it required a lot of bloodshed, a lot of loss of human lives and wealth and this was possible because you, in the hands of some of these Mahajanapadas there was the accumulation of a great social surplus. This social surplus came because of the revolutionary changes that were taking place in the agricultural field because of the use of iron implements. This use of iron technology was responsible for the abundant growth of uh, agricultural products and accumulation of agricultural products in the hands of a few. As a result of this, we find that laws were being formulated, explanations in scriptures, in texts were being given to justify their power, but there were other uh, considerations as well. There were other aspects as well. We find that so far the predominance of the Brahmins and the Kshatriyas which was laid down in the Vedas were being challenged by those who were integral part of this production process but who did not enjoy the ritual status. Actually in society they were very powerful. They had great wealth in their hands but ritually they were considered inferior and as a result of this it was quite natural that it was going to have its reflection in the religious texts in the, uh, as well um, which called for a new social uh, system and which was uh, which had some sort of a religious backing and we find that there were the rise of new religious ideas as well and the proponents of these religious ideas came from the so-called higher classes, one of the higher classes, the Kshatriyas. And we find that the two major religions which was going to influence Indian philosophy, Indian society, to some extent Indian politics also, there were Jainism and Buddhism, although there were other religions as well because 6th century BC we find that people were groping in the dark to come out with some ideas, to come out with some solutions to the, uh, uh, the ever emerging uh, political, social and economic changes that were taking place in society and as the uh, horizon of the political activity was ever increasing. And uh, we find that the Vedic ideas 
uh, were some sort of questioned the Upanishadic ideas. Uh, to some extent, they influenced these religious, new religious ideas because they were very much, they were very Indian and ingrained in the Indian system, in the Indian thought process. But they tried to make new explanations so that the a larger community could be integrated into this process and they started from the Upanishadic concept of the uh, transmigration of the soul, the salvation. You know, salvation was one idea which involved, which, which inspired, uh, sort of influenced everyone. And what was the set notions of salvation? What was salvation meant the end of rebirth? And the end of all suffering, but salvation according to the Vedic prescription, it could be obtained by first continuous prayers and the mediation of the Brahman and the offering of sacrifices. That means those who could not afford the tremendous expenses of the sacrifices lay outside the pale of the process of salvation or the attainment of salvation. And Shudras and women were considered as absolutely incapable of attainment of salvation. But as I, as we have already uh, mentioned, there were changes. And we can say that there was revolutionary changes in the religious thought. And we find that the uh, supreme position of the Brahman as the mediator between God and men, as the sole instrument in the attainment of salvation, and also the, uh, the, the process through which salvation could be attained, and that salvation could be attained by all. These were the changes that were taking place. The first historical proponent of Jainism uh, is Parsvanatha, who is said to have been born and taught 250 years earlier than Mahavira. He also came from the uh, ro royal uh, Kshatriya class. And it is very interesting to know that uh, all these religious teachers, both in Jainism and Buddhism, they are coming from the Kshatriya community and sort of challenging the authority of the Brahmins. So, uh, Parshvanatha expounded the first few principles of Jainism, which was later expounded by Mahavira. And Mahavira, he came up in the 6th century uh, BC also. He belonged to the nobility of Vaishali. His mother was a princess and a father was a Vaishalian nobleman. And he was related by birth to the ruling dynasty of Magadh, which was the most important, one of the most important dynasties of its times in the 6th century BC. Now, Mahavira also sort of shares uh, some of the legends of Buddha that he was, uh, he was also married, he also had a daughter and he left his daughter and wife behind in his pursuit for the truth and he also uh, lived in the company of many learned men of his age, one important being Gosala, and he was unhappy. And we must also remember that he was slightly an older contemporary of uh, um, Gautama Buddha. And uh, Mahavira, he uh, then, he also searched, his, he went off alone in his quest for truth, and also his wisdom came in the six, uh, after 12 years of his uh, wondering, his uh, enlightenment came. And of course, in the case of Mahavira, there was greater austerity. Mahavira is said to be a jina, 
because he has conquered misery and sufferings. And since he is a Jaina, his followers are known as Jaina, Jainas. Before, they were also known as Nirgranthas, which means someone without any fetters. So the whole idea of Jainism was to live an austere life, to live, have to undergo penances, and these penances and austerity will lead to enlightenment that is Kaivalya. After attaining enlightenment, after attaining Kaivalya, Mahavira started to preach. We have actually five important uh, preachings of Mahavira which relate to non-injury to animals or uh, for, uh, for that matter any living beings. Then they say do not steal, do not lie, do not accumulate or uh, you do, uh, do not actually preserve or hoard. They are very much against hoarding and practice or observe continence that is Brahmacharya. Mahavira also actually taught a number of things. Some of them perhaps were preached by uh, Parsonatha and few were added by Mahavira. He also said that life should not be taken. So Ahimsa is a very important uh, principle in the teaching of the Jains. Nothing should be taken which is not freely given. That is, uh, one should not steal. Then uh, no falsehood should be spoken. That is, no lies should be spoken. We find great similarity in the Panchashila also. That shows the, uh, the sameness, that shows the concepts, the religious concept, the social concepts almost escalated to the uh, position of a religion, the social behaviors, you know, that was prevalent. What was more useful? How can you uh, perfect yourself? by practicing these and almost looking upon them as religious principles. The Jainas believed in God, but uh, what is interesting is that they placed God after Jina. So in spite of the belief in God, they always felt that the Jina was the supreme. And so it has to be whenever there was representation of Mahavira, and then we have the representation of other gods below Mahavira. So this is one thing that we find in Jainism which is important for us. Another very important thing in respect of Jainism is that that they believed in their whole idea was in the quest for uh, renunciation from sufferings. And they thought that unlike the Vedic rituals that no kind of or no amount of ritual was necessary to get uh, oneself free. What one needed was right action, right faith and right belief. If one did these things, one was one pers uh, preserved these things or one went through all these things, the right action, right belief and right faith, then one could attain enlightenment and one could free oneself from the fetters of life. This is known as three ratna or the three jewels in J Jainism. Where Buddhism and Jainism differed was that while Buddhism, as we have he heard before, was against the caste system, Mahavira did not denounce or did not question the caste system. He felt that caste was a part and parcel of the life and a person can be born in an upper caste if he practices these five uh, teachings, if he practices this, um, uh, the, if he pen practices penances, if he practices an austere life, then one can develop and then can be reborn as in a, uh, in a higher Varna. So he does not denounce the Varna system as we find in Buddha, uh, Buddhism. Most important difference between Jainism and Buddhism is that, you know, Jainism emphasized more on Ahimsa. Whereas vegetarianism was not compulsory for the Buddhists, for the Jains, it was uh, almost, it, it was the most essential thing, you know, that no life should be ever disturbed, no life should be taken. Whether it is the life of an animal, forget about the life of the human beings, life of an animal or even a small insect or even imperceptible living things. We have 
basically two different kinds of sects in Jainism. One was the Shvetamvara, that is the white clad, and the other was the Digamvara, that is the sky clad. The white clad, the, that is the Shvetamvara group, they actually believed in the reincarnation, uh, they believed in getting uh, arms in bowls. So they went out in the villages, in the neighborhood, wearing a white dress and in search of uh, some food because they feel the a cavalin needs food for its existence. And they also believed in the uh, in the uh, women, uh, in the inclusion of women in their fold. But whereas, if you look at the practices of the Digambaras, the sky clad, we find that Digambaras were very much against begging with arms. They actually uh, begging with cups or bowls. They actually went, when they went for begging, they had their uh, cups of the hands uh, used. And then what we find is that they did not believe in the inclusion of women, and they also did not believe that a cavalin has to eat for uh, his sustenance. So this was the two major difference that we find among the Digambaras and the Shetambaras. There was no basic uh, uh, doctrinal difference between the two. The Digambaras, uh, you know, it, it came up at the time when there was a great, uh, at the time of King Chandragupta Maurya, when there was a great famine in northern India, part of the Jains moved to southern India with their scriptures so that they were not perished by this um, natural disaster. So those who went to the south, they wore white clothes. They were known as Sitambaras. But those who lived in India, uh, in northern India, they were known as the Digambaras. That is, uh, they practiced nudity. They were sky clad. And when we walk into a Jain monastery, a Jain temple, we know that if Mahavira is projected in a nude form, it is a Digambara temple and it is shorn of all kinds of excesses, all kinds of decorations. It is very austere. It is very austere. And if you go to a Sitambara monastery, a temple, you would see all the uh, 24 Tirthankaras and Mahavira is seen in white clothes. And uh, of course, uh, what were the doctrinal differences? Not much, but uh, for uh, the Sitambaras, the Gambaras, extreme austerity is emphasized. And they think that women cannot attain salvation. They also think that Mahavira was not married, the Digambaras. They, they say that Mahavira was not married, that Mahavira didn't have any children, and uh, they also think that women are incapable of attainment of nirvana. Mahabir continued to preach Jainism for the rest of his life. We find that he finally expired at the age of 72 uh, in Pavapuri, which was near Rajgir, and even after that, Jainism continued to exist. There were different branches, but it continued to exist in North India, particularly in Western India. And till date, we have Jainism very much present in the Indian subcontinent. Another school of philosophy which was prevalent in the Ganga Valley at this time with its center at Sravasti and having a very good following was that of the Ajivikas. Actually the Ajivikas were there even perhaps before the before Bardhamana Mahavira. It was a going concern even before that because we know that Mahavira was one of the adherents of Makala Gosala who was an exponent of the Ajivika faith. The main thing is of Ajivikism is that they believed in Nyoti. That is, it is a totally deterministic 
uh, religion where they think that everything is determined by the fate. That is, one human effort has no place in this whole concept of Nyoti or Ajivikism. So these Ajivika monks, this uh, practiced austerity, they practiced strong penances, and they believed that anyone could be join their uh, force, anyone could join their fold, and they could be from any section of the society. So they did not believe in caste, but they believed that even if we try very hard, we cannot achieve something because it is not determined. So Niyotibad or predetermination was the basic essence of Ajivikism. Mauryan Emperor Ashoka and his grandson Dasharatha was great supporters or patrons of Ajivikism. We find that they donated caves. We have inscriptions of Ashoka and Dasharatha regarding this, that they donated caves in the Barabar and Nagarjuni hills uh, near Gaya. And even in Sri Lanka, we find that Ajivikism flourished a lot under different rulers. Next to this, we also find another school that is of spiritual nihilism and its proponent was Ajita Kesha Kambalin. He was the proponent of this school and we find he was, it, his, his doctrine was out and out materialistic and he deviated a great deal from all the three that we have spoken about from the giants, from the Buddhists, from the Ajivakas. It was very different. He believed that there was no transmigration of the soul, there was no rebirth because consciousness is a part of the human body. Consciousness always remains within the human body. So after death, all these different parts of the human body, they are separated and therefore there is the, con the, con the consciousness as a part of human existence also ceases. The question of prayer, ritual, sacrifices, nothing is important and nothing is necessary. So life ceases, there is no life after death. So this is also was, was a very, very revolutionary idea considered in the context of the 6th century. So the question of salvation, the question of uh, the cessation of Dukha, all these things do not figure at all in the uh, in the uh, this school of philosophy of spiritual nihilism of Ajita. Charvakism is also known as the materialist school because the Charvak uh, doctrine believed in perception. So they believe that whatever can be seen is have to be believed. So when a soul cannot be seen, they don't believe in the presence of the soul. And here, by not believing the presence of the soul, they were questioning the Upanishadic doctrine. Charvakism also relates to absolute enjoyment worldly of worldly pleasures. Therefore, it sometimes it is said that it is actually a kind of Lokayata doctrine where also we have this enjoyment and pleasure as the aim of life. It is said in the Jaina text that there were Charvaka texts also, but we do not have this with us today. Whatever we know about Charvakism is from a text known as Sharva Darshana Shangraha. And one chapter of Sharva Darshana Shangraha talks about 
the philosopher as Charbak, and it is said that Charbak was the philosopher of Brihaspati. So Charvakism continued as an important religious belief for some time among the people who were very much into worldly existence, who were very much into questioning soul and as, uh, as well as the transmigration of soul and who believed in life. So it is a completely different kind of religious philosophy, religious ideology, which is complete in complete opposition to the severe penances and austerities that one perceives in the doctrines of Ajivika, one perceives in the doctrine of uh, uh, doctrine of the Jainas. Therefore, scholars and philosophers have actually taken Charvakism and spiritual nihilism as a kind, similar kind of philosophy, where which talks about the complete enjoyment of worldly living and the non-existence of the soul, and where you find that the total body after his death is actually mingled into air, water. Uh, fire. So the elements of life is very important for the Charvaka philosophers. Charvakism did not sustain for very long and later on we find that actually it was Jainism and Buddhism which sustained. But when we are talking about all these different non-sectarian religions, we have to keep in mind in that it does not mean the complete annihilation or complete wiping away of Vedic Brahmanism. Vedic Brahmanism was very much present in this period also. Though we have these different doctrines, doctrinal beliefs, and we have people following this, but at the same time, there were people who were following the Vedic Brahmanical practices, the rituals of sacrifices, and the rituals of uh, pragya and other things. So overall, if we look at the religious situation of 6th century BC, we find that there it was a situation where we find the presence of new religious reformation movements, where we find that these new religious formations were attracted to the people, where people were attracted by them, because there was, in some of them, there was participation of the common people. They did not believe generally in caste system and or the Varna theory, therefore people accepted it. But at the same time, it does not mean that the Vedic Brahmanism was totally washed away from the ancient Indian scenario.